And we're back. Uh, we're still doing applications of derivatives. This is topic four. This is what will end our first semester of AP Calculus AB. Um, the last couple classes, we've really worked towards a goal. And that goal is how do we determine where and what values are the relative extrema at? So uh, we began by talking about the extreme value theorem and said, well, we guarantee in some cases that there'll be an absolute max and absolute min. We're like, very cool. And then we talked about how to find those. And we said, well, we find critical points and we test the critical points and endpoints and whichever one's the biggest, absolute max, whichever one's the smallest, absolute min, still crushing it. Then we move on to the next day where we say, okay, now that we've done that with the first derivative, we've established where the first derivative becomes zero, critical points are undefined. Um, now we're gonna use the first derivative to determine where our function is increasing and decreasing. And we introduce the idea of sign charts. Well, today is kind of that conclusion of how do we put everything together and use all of our knowledge to determine where those relative extrema, relative mins and maxes, are located. Um, so there's a quick opener here for you, and your goal is, of course, to try all four of these. Um, if you get stuck anywhere, you can always hit play and then um, pause when you get to another point. So here we go. Hopefully you've gone through and tried the opener. Um, I will just do this one very quickly. A graph with three critical points here. Well, um, here is one critical point, a second critical point, and we'll make a sharp point, the third critical point. Um, oh. I should read my directions better. It says exactly one relative max, one local min. So let's do it like this then. Let's have it go to a max, a neither, and then a sharp point for a min. There we go. We have three points. Here's my max, here's my neither, here's my min. Love it. Well, at all relative extrema, and there's only two relative extrema here, um, what does the slope of our graph have to be? Well, the slope has to either be zero or undefined, right? And you could say that using f prime as well. You could say f prime has to be zero or f prime of x does not exist. That has to be true. I challenge you to draw a relative max or min where one of those two things isn't true. But the issue here though is that this point in the middle also has a spot where the slope, where the derivative is equal to zero. So how do we narrow down those three points to just give instructions to find two points. Well, maybe we should start thinking about derivatives in terms of what they measure, which is the slope. And we talk about on the left side of this relative max, the slope where all the derivatives are positive, and on the right side, the slopes where all the derivatives are negative. That's the same thing over here, negative derivatives, positive derivatives. But look at the neither, the neither I'll do in yellow. Positive, or I'm sorry, negative slope where decreasing negative slope we're still decreasing. And so maybe that could help us to distinguish a critical point to determining if that's actually a relative extremum versus just one of those weird little flat spots. So what else has to happen? Well, some people say, will say the slope, which we should probably use our calculus speak and call it the derivative, must change. And now if you just say change, well, what do you mean by change? I think we probably mean change signs, right? Our slope is positive and then negative, yeah? Or our derivative is negative and then the derivatives become positive. Um, and if that happens, I think now we have all the criteria necessary to establish what makes something a critical point. Um, so why don't you take a quick second then and see if you can determine a method to find relative extrema. Right? How can you determine where they are? So hopefully you've had a little time to think about that, and now we can actually see how well you did determining your procedure. Um, so let's jump down to our main lesson. The first derivative test uses, shockingly, the first derivative to test if a point on a graph is a relative min, relative max, or neither. And it's called the first derivative test because it uses the first derivative. And later on, we're going to learn the second derivative test, which, of course, will use the second derivative. Now, 
really all this process is going to do is add one more step to your increasing and decreasing functions that we learned last class. That's why I really like this unit. It ties so well together. Um, it, you first find critical points, then you learn how to build sign charts, and now we're just building one more point on that, but you get to practice all the same skills you've learned so far. So how do we use the first derivative test, or how do we use the first derivative to test various points? Well, the first step isn't going to shock you. You find critical points, and how do you do that? Well, you determine what x's make f prime equal to 0, or what x's make f prime not exist. Nice. Second step, you build a sign chart using your critical points to divide up the interval. We did that last class. Third step, you determine the intervals where f is increasing or decreasing by plugging a test value. And if we want to see where f is increasing or decreasing, we plug that test value into f prime, into the first derivative, right? If f prime of x is greater than 0, then f of x is increasing. However, if f prime of x is less than 0, then f of x is decreasing. And that's where you draw the respective lines in your sign chart, right? Your sign chart like goes up, down, and might go up for a while, something like that. We have one last step. By looking at your sign chart, you should be able to see the locations of the relative extrema, right? For example, if you see a sign chart where it goes up, down, and then up over here, you have two relative extrema. We can extrapolate that from the sign chart, which is really, really nice. However, you do need to write a conclusion for each point and you need to write that conclusion without using the phrase sign chart. Luckily, we're going to do that exactly how we did last class. We're just going to state the information in the sign chart. Um, there are some sample conclusions here, and I'll try to reference back to this as we do some practice problems, because really all of today is just doing practice problems. Um, so uh, let's take a look. We could say that x is, and this is blank because it can be anything we want, and let's say it's 4. x is 4 is a relative max because f prime of x changes from positive to negative at x equals 4. And we'll see that in the sign chart shortly, so no rush. Um, we could also say that x equals 4 is a relative max because the slope of f of x, and I'll try to maybe um, highlight the terms that mean the same thing, the slope of f of x changes from positive to negative. So notice they first talked about f prime, then they also talked about the slope of f of x. But here's the thing. If you just said because the slope changes from positive to negative, nope you do not get points for your conclusion. Your conclusion must reference the graph correctly. And I said the graph there, and that's not actually good enough. The graph of what? Well, you can reference the graph of f of x or the graph of f prime. I don't care, but you better say one of those specifically. You never just say because the graph changes, because um, the equation changes, you need to explicitly reference. Never it changes, no it in calculus. One other way you could say this is x is a relative max because f of x changes from increasing to decreasing. All three of those in orange really mean the same thing, right? Increasing is when f prime is positive, and decreasing is when f prime is negative. So that's saying the same thing as up here. It's your choice. I tend to work with f prime more than f because our sign chart is talking about f prime and it's much easier for me to read f prime does this. But I will try to use all three of those by the end of today. Um, last but not least, please make sure you show a beginning and ending of each step. If you want to find critical points, state that you're setting f prime equal to 0, just like that. Don't just skip right into where you set the derivative equal to 0. Show this first. Um, and there are a couple reasons for that. Reason one is if you get the derivative wrong, sometimes just stating this will get you a point, whereas if you use the wrong equation, it won't, right? Um, once you say this equals zero, it's totally okay to say f prime of x equals zero, and then you just say x equals four and seven, whatever the answers are, right? You can go from there to there. They really don't care about how you get from your setup, which is this guy, to the answer. That's algebra for the most part. And if you can do the algebra in your head, great. But they do expect you to show a setup and an answer. Okay? Um, so let's try a couple examples. I think I really have three example problems, and that's that for today. Identify any relative extrema given the equation and interval. All right, well, let's go through our steps. First step, again, hopefully should not shock you too much. You're going to find critical points, which you pretty much do all the time from here on out to the future. Critical points. 
we start by finding the derivative. Um, don't forget, please, that f of x is x cubed minus 3 halves x squared. We've seen that set up before. Very common. It saves space. Um, but don't think you need to use the quotient rule. Just write them separately. So let's see. 3 comes down. 3x squared. The 2's cancel. So minus 3x. Looks awesome. If we can, we should. We will. We'll factor. 3x times x minus 1. Okay, that's the derivative. Now we find critical points. So we say we're going to state that we're setting the derivative equal to zero, right? Um, we could also state that we're going to look for where the derivative is undefined, but the derivative is defined everywhere. There's nothing that will break either of these equations. I usually don't even bother to state it if we know that the derivative is defined everywhere. Sometimes that comes back to bite me in the butt because I forget to do it and then I lose critical points. So it's never a bad thing to write both. However, most often we just have to worry about that zero. Okay, what is the equation for f prime? Well, we already have it in factored form, so we're definitely going to use that. Okay, and then two equations, something like this, and solve. Zero or one. Nifty. We have our critical points. Okay, next up, and this is what we did last class, sign chart time. Okay, so here's my sign chart. Notice that this time we're only going, I didn't like that one. Notice this time we're only going between negative 5 and 5. So here's negative 5, here's 5. We are looking at the signs of f prime. And I'm going to try to say that that way every single time so that you understand we are talking about f prime of x because f prime is what controls the slope of f. We want to see all the intricacies of the f's slope, which is f prime. A couple critical points. Looks like 0 makes the slope 0 and 1 makes the slope 0, right? f prime is 0 at those points. And up here again are your x values. Okay, how do we figure out what goes in the sign chart? Well, we just plug in some values. Um, again, you'll notice that when I plug these values in, I don't really care about the answer. I just want to see if the answer is positive or negative. So right here, I might want to try just f prime of what's in between 0 and negative 5? How about negative 1? Well, f prime of negative 1, if we try this up here, we get 3 times a negative, and then negative 1 minus 1 is another negative. So I think it becomes 3 times a negative times a negative. Negative times a negative is a positive. Um, so I think we get a positive if we plug in negative 1 right here. Boop. Easy enough. Between 0 and 1, I think 1 half will be a pretty nice value. Um, if I try 1 half in here, this is clearly positive. This is negative. Positive times a negative. Oh, that is a negative. Nice. And last but not least, from 1 to 5, well, if you try 4, I bet you can see that all becomes positive. Um, so we get a positive up here. So what does that tell us about our original graph, f of x? It tells us that f of x increases, and then decreases, and then increases. Or you could say that f prime of x changes from positive to negative to positive. Two ways to think about it, they both mean the same thing. Nifty. That's what we covered last class, and you can see those increasing and decreasing intervals. Um, however, this one is asking us to find relative extrema. Well, look at your sign chart. I see a relative max here and a relative min here, and they look like sharp points. They're not. There is curvature there. I always just draw straight lines. We're not going to learn about that curvature of graphs until um, really next class, actually. Um, so I just keep them as straight lines. It's not going to hurt you at all. You can still see the relative mins and maxes. Um, so let's, let's finish this off. So we're going to start with x equals 0, this guy up here. Clearly, by looking at the sign chart, it's a relative max, so we should probably say that. x equals 0 is a relative max. Well, what caused it to be a relative max from the sign chart? We're not going to say, because the green line went up here, right? No, we're just going to use the quantities or the qualities of what's in the sign chart and explain that what made it a relative max is because, so x equals 0 is relative max because f prime of x changes, or you could say changed, changes from positive to negative. Right? That is why the green lines met up here, because f prime changed from positive to negative. Okay, let's do the same thing for x equals 1. Um, when I do x equals 1, I'm gonna, we could say it's because f prime changes from negative to positive. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, however, I'm going to switch it up just so you can see another way to say this. So x equals 1 is a relative min because, and we'll use f of x this time, f of x changes from 
decreasing to increasing. I'm less of a fan of doing it this way because everything we've done is revolved around f prime, so I don't see why you wouldn't use f prime in your conclusion. Um, especially, I think this opens the door to misinterpretation, or especially on your side, um, writing something incorrectly. Because if you write f prime of x changes from decreasing to increasing, nope, you lose the point. f prime does not change from decreasing to increasing. That means something different that we haven't talked about. You need to get it right. So my heavy suggestion is just talk about what's in your sign chart. F prime is in your sign chart. Talk about F prime. Okay. So, I mean, that's really as bad as it gets. All right, let's get this free response started. Uh, there are four parts here, A, B, C, and D, and there's nothing too terrible. Um, I changed a typo on mine. I've already changed it on yours, so no stress there. Uh, so the typo is just the interval. It's supposed to be from negative 4 to 4, and I had negative 3 to 4. Old problem, so let's get to it. Um, is there guaranteed to be a point where f of x equals 0? Looks to me like they're guaranteeing an output. Um, so I think th this is immediately making me think of some theorem, either the IVT, EVT, or squeeze theorem, and that's a giveaway for that guarantee right here. It's not the squeeze, there's no limits. EVT talks about absolute maxes and mins. It's probably got to be IVT then. Um, and hopefully at this point you're comfortable with setting up the IVT. I think all we have to do at this point is just find the outputs of each of the endpoints and hope that this output is somewhere between. And if zero isn't, you honestly probably made a mistake. Generally on a theorem when they say, is it guaranteed? The answer is most commonly, yes, it's guaranteed. So that's a nice way to check your work. You go through it and like, uh, I don't see it here. You probably made an arithmetic mistake. Uh, this is no calculator. It's designed to help you practice those arithmetic skills. So let's get to it. We're doing f of negative 4. So that's 2 times negative 4 cubed plus 3 times negative 4 squared, minus 12 times negative 4 plus 1. And I'll take you through my thinking. I usually do each term separately. Uh, negative 4 cubed is negative 64, times 2 is negative 128. Uh, negative 4 squared is 16, 16 times 3 is positive um, 48. Whoops. This is another positive 48, 12 times 4, plus 1. I always do all the positives first. So 48 and 48 looks like 96 plus one more is 97. Um, and then I think we can probably subtract these and throw a negative on them, yeah? So if we subtract them, looks like one, and then 12 minus nine is 13. It looks like negative 31 to me. Uh, nothing too terrible, though. Uh, we should also probably try the other end point. We've actually done most of the calculations already. We just have to watch those negatives, and I think everything else will look all right. We probably don't even need to show this extra bit of step. Um, but, oh well, completeness. So we know this is going to be positive 128, positive 48, negative 48. That's so nice. These cancel. And I'm getting 129. Then ask yourself, is zero between these two values? It certainly looks like it, so I think we are good to go. Let's get our conclusion in. Most theorems that we deal with so far are going to start with the same, as f of x is continuous on, and I always like to put the interval to, on negative 4 to 4, right? And the other thing we need to show is that the output is between these two outputs. I always like to use these over here. f of negative 4 is the smaller one, so f of negative 4 is less than 0, the output we're interested in, which is less than 4. So as all that happened, then the IVT guarantees, and then intense laziness, and I'll put a little star here, guarantees a point where f of x equals 0 on that interval. I'll just put a little star up here. Don't do that on the AP exam, but I just didn't want to write anymore. Um, so yeah, I think we get the idea there. Part B, find the critical points. We're excited. This is just the same thing we've been doing. We get to practice our derivative rules, be wonderful humans. It's nothing bad at all. Um, so 3 times 2, I'm working with the original equation up here, right? 3 times 2 is 6x squared <clears throat> plus 6x minus 12. Um, as always, we're going to try and factor this. Um, I'm going to just work down to save some space to the right. I think they all have a 6 in common, which actually is really nice. It makes our factoring way easier because now the value in front of x is 1 uh, minus 2. So it looks like x plus 2, x minus 1. Sweet! Um, I think at this point, then, we need to find critical points. Critical points occur when the derivative equals 0 or when the derivative is undefined, but this is a straight old polynomial, nothing's going to break that. So let's set our derivative equal to zero. 
don't forget that if there is that leading coefficient, in this case a 6, it's not going to really impact our derivative at all. Um, so you could leave it off once you set things equal to 0. It looks like we get 2x values, negative 2 or 1. Nice. They just asked for the critical points, actually, so I don't know why I saved so much space. Those are the two critical points. There are no others. Nothing makes this undefined. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, so it's probably worth mentioning again. This says find the critical points. Uh, the word point here is very loosely used by AP. Um, I think it's pretty commonly accepted that a critical point is just the x value, which, full disclosure, is pretty silly, because any other time we ask you to find a point, it's x comma y. Um, so if you want, you can go through and actually find those outputs. And since I have the space, I'm going to. Um, and hint, you're actually going to need this later, so why not? Um, so we're going to find outputs for each of these guys. And the outputs that I'm talking about aren't on F prime. If we plug these into F prime, you should know what answer we get. We get 0. We set F prime to 0, so these are the x's that make F prime equal to 0. They will always be that, or undefined if there are any. Um, now, we're going to plug these critical points into the original equation. So, um, and again, I call them critical points. Your book is actually more careful than I. Your book calls them critical values, and I don't even think they're values. Usually those are outputs. I would say they're like critical locations. However, we usually call them critical points, even if they're just x's, but let's go ahead and try that equation. So we're going to find F of negative 2. And that gives me 2 times negative 2 cubed plus 3 times negative 2 squared minus 12 times negative 2 plus 1. And we'll just work down this way. So let's see, that's negative 8 times 2 is negative 16. 4 times 3 is 12 plus 24 plus 1. Okay, and going further, um, we can work these 12 and 24 is 36. 36 minus 16 is 20, 20 plus 1 is 21. You should probably double check that I may have messed it up as with much other math tonight. Um, but we found first critical point is located at negative 2 and has a value of 21. It's never bad to give that extra information if you want. The AP exam would just expect the x values. Um, but again, why not be better than that? And then f of 1. Oh, finally, this one's easy. Right, because every, whenever you um, raise 1 to a power, it's just 1. So we just really have to take the coefficients of this problem. 2 plus 3 minus 12 plus 1. 2 plus 3 is 5 plus 1 more is 6. 6 minus 12, I think, is negative 6. And it gives us our other full critical point, 1, negative 6. Okay, and again, I promise I'm not wasting your time. You'll need those later. All right, so we found the critical points, which are really these, but we went a little bit extra. Yay us. Let's move on to Z. Find and justify any relative extrema. Ooh, relative extrema. Oh, wait, that's just the sign chart thing. That's our first derivative test. We're going to use the first derivative, or the sign chart for the first derivative, to test all of our points. Okay, so we make our nice little sign chart. Don't forget we're going from negative 4 to 4. That's the given interval that mine had a typo at the beginning. Um, we need to use f prime to test various points here. And we found two critical points up above, so we might as well use those two. Negative 2 made f prime equal to 0, and 1 made f prime equal to 0. Now, when we use f prime to test, we're not actually testing the critical points in f prime. We're testing other points in f prime. Right, we're going to test, well, I think probably, um, I'm going to rewrite what f prime is because I'm going to need that later on. That was 6 times, and I'll use the factored form here. Some people are like, wait, which version of f prime should I use? It doesn't matter, but I would much rather plug values into this factored form and multiply them because we're just interested in positive versus negative as opposed to have to do lots of extra math up here. So usually the factored form is the way to go. Um, so again, we're going to use this factored form to test points on the intervals and decide using those intervals if we have relative mins or maxes here. So let's begin. Uh, the first one I'd want to try is f prime of negative 3. That's on this interval. Um, thinking about negative 3 over here, that makes this negative. That makes this negative as well. Negative times a negative is a positive. The 6 is really doing nothing for us. So it's just going to hang out there, and we end up with a positive. Cool. All right, let's also try f prime of 0 is really easy, right? That would be positive. 0 minus 1 is negative, positive times negative, that's a negative. Um, and you're starting to probably come to the conclusion, you're like, wait, does it always go positive, negative, positive, or negative, positive, negative? Does it always alternate and sign here? And the answer is, no, it doesn't. Um, many polynomials do 
but not enough to predict it. And there are many other functions that certainly do not alternate. So you really do need to go through and find each of these by hand just to verify that they are not or they are alternating in sign in the sign chart. So 2 in here is a positive, 2 minus 1 is a positive, positive minus positive is positive, and so this one we see the original graph f of x will increase, then f of x decreases, then f of x increases. It did ask us to justify those relative extrema, very, very common. So we do something like this. We'd say x equals negative 2 is a relative max because f prime of x changes from positive to negative. Some people will go further and they'll say because f prime of x changes from positive to negative at x equals negative 2, so they say it a second time, and that is honestly probably better than the way I wrote it, but it's a little bit extra too, and so I'm just leaving it out. x equals 1 is a relative min because f prime of x changes from negative to positive. I also don't advise using air quotes. I imagine, honestly, you'd get full points and the readers would know what you meant, but just take an extra five seconds to write out the words. Don't be like your teacher on here. Okay, so we've identified the relative max and the relative min. Very cool. Is there anything left? There is part D. Find and justify the values of any absolute extrema on the given interval if they exist. Wasn't that what we just did um, before? Oh, they said relative extrema, right? Um, we need to remember how to find absolute extrema. Ugh, let's see, thinking back, thinking back, some sort of test. The candidates test, I think, finds us absolute extrema. And to remind you, the candidates test tells us that our absolute values, our absolute max and min, are either going to occur at the critical points, these guys right here, or they will occur at the end points. And so I think to put this all together, and just to remind you, I'll write out this candidates test. Um, we just literally test all of the candidates. And the way we do that is we use an input-output table, something like this. And let's list our candidates. We know the endpoints, negative 4 and 4, are always candidates. Okay. What else are candidates? Well, I think we had two critical points here, and our two critical points were negative 2 and 1. How do we test them? Well, we have to plug all of these into f of x, which could be a huge slog, except we did all of them already. Negative 4 and 4 were cleverly asked about in the first part, where it was the IVT. Negative 4 is negative 31, 4 is 129. So negative 31 and 129. And negative 2 and 1, I made you find earlier when I told you about those critical points. And I wasn't lying when I said this is a real point, and we would need it later. Negative 2 gives us 21, and 1 gives us negative 6. Look at that. And actually, this has been really common the last couple years on free responses, where they sneakily, subtly, surreptitiously uh, make you find these values earlier on. And then they go, okay, we'll do the candidates test. And if you've done things right, you've either found all or most of the values earlier, so you shouldn't have to plug in four or five or six possible candidates, maybe just one, or in this case, zero. Uh, we're not done yet, though. We do need to actually identify the absolute min and the absolute max. You can't just leave it here and circle it. We need to be specific. Okay, clearly 129 is the largest, so this is going to be our absolute max. And negative 31 is the smallest. That's going to be our absolute min. Um, now, a couple of you had asked, you said, well, wait, it says justify. You didn't justify anything. Well, we did justify. Um, the candidates test is the justification, right? There is a find. Well, I found them over here. And then there is a justify. That is the whole test. You justify your answer by showing you understand what cause um, absolute extrema to happen. And in this case, what causes them to happen, or in any closed continuous interval case, what causes them to happen is they either occur at the endpoints or the critical points. You tried all of those, and now you found your answer. So this is enough justification, which is really, really nice. It saves you all that extra writing from before. Um, I think this is going to conclude us for today. I do have one more problem if you want to try it. It's pretty gnarly, and you'll probably want to bring a calculator into play for it, um, but I'm not going to go into it for the video. I think you guys will be just fine. Um, 
If you do want to see how it's done, I have all the solutions posted um, on Teams, or you can always email me, but I think we have gotten the lion's share out of the way for this first derivative test. The next couple days are going to stray away from the first derivative and move us into the territory of the second derivative. The first derivative told us about the slope of f of x. What does the second derivative help us with? So keep that in your mind. Try your independent practice. Thanks for always tuning in and being so on top of your work, and I'm excited to virtually see you tomorrow.